What are the words that on YouTube get you the biggest number of views? Hates, destroys, obliterates, slams. All hateful, negative words. If this video was called, Johan Hari makes you feel good, it would not get many views. If it's been given the title, Johan Hari hates, obliterates and destroys the algorithm, it's gonna get a lot of views. At the moment, social media is making us incredibly angry. And if you wanna understand why, you've gotta follow a chain of logic. You are not the customer of Facebook. You are the product they sell to the advertisers. Every time you open Facebook or any of the other social media sites, they are making money out of you. All of their engineering power, all of their algorithms is designed towards keeping you scrolling as often and as long as they possibly can. That leads to anger in a slightly weird way. It comes down to something called negativity bias. Human beings will stare for longer at something that upsets us or angers us than we do at something that makes us feel good and happy, right? Anyone who's ever seen an accident on the motorway knows exactly what that effect is. You stared longer at the mangled car wreck than you did at the pretty flowers on the other side of the road. This is a very deep thing in human beings. 10 week old babies will stare longer at an angry face than a happy face. It's probably for a good evolutionary reason. Our ancestors who were more alert to sources of danger got to be our ancestors, the ancestors who were just like, oh, look at the pretty flowers, probably got eaten. But that quirk of human psychology has a terrible effect when it combines with algorithms and engineering that are designed to keep us scrolling for as long as possible. Picture two teenage girls who go to the same party. Going home on the bus, one of them opens Facebook and goes, that was a really nice party, I had a nice time, everyone was lovely. Second girl opens her phone and goes, Karen was a right fucking slag at that party and her boyfriend's a twat. The algorithms are scanning everything you do. That first message, the nice one, it'll put that message into some people's feed. That second status update will go to far more feeds because if it's enraging, it's engaging. It keeps more people looking. Now that is bad enough at the level of two teenage girls going home from a party. As a society, we've all been plugged into this anger machine. Everyone is incentivized to be the most mean and angry version of themselves. They're rewarded for it. There's never any dialogue where people say, you know, I think you might be right on this, but I think you're probably wrong on that, you know, but you seem like a nice person, even though we don't agree. Everything is like it's the last scene in Columbo and he's accusing people of being a murderer, or it's the last scene in Dracula and you have Van Helsing driving a stake into someone's heart. We can disagree with each other. It's one of the great joys of life. One of the worst hells in the world would be being locked in a room with people who only agreed with you. Even the people with ideas you think are horrible do kind things for some people. But we've got to get out of this extreme binary thinking that these anger-based algorithms are constantly pushing us into. It's deeply psychologically unhealthy. It's deeply socially unhealthy. What kind of society can we have if we hate each other all the time? What Facebook's own internal research, which was fortunately leaked to us because they weren't going to tell us, showed something really important. What their own scientists found is that Facebook's current business model, keep people scrolling, which hacks into this negativity bias, was very deep in their business model. Indeed, they said it was inherent to the business model and the only solution was for Facebook to abandon that business model and choose a degrowth strategy. They also showed that a quarter of all the people who joined neo-Nazi groups in Germany joined them because Facebook's algorithm specifically recommended it. So a lot of people are responding to this rage machine by saying the solution is for the social media companies to effectively become the censor, to effectively decide who gets to speak and who doesn't and to cut off certain voices. Tristan Harris is one of the most important critics of big tech having been at the heart of the machine himself. It gives a really good metaphor that I think helps us to understand why I don't think that's right. If you picture this machinery at the moment, what it's doing is it's tilting the entire landscape more towards crazy. If you picture it as like a mountain, it's tilting the whole mountain and loads of rocks and boulders are falling down. And what we're saying is, oh, you need to just build nets to catch some of the boulders. That's not the solution. The solution is stop tilting the mountain. We need to deal with the underlying factors that are making people angry. Now, once we've done that, there'll of course be a legitimate debate about, okay, who do you allow on the platform and who don't you allow on the platform? But that's not the first step in the argument. The first step in the argument is, okay, let's stop it driving people crazy. These social media sites are profoundly damaging individual attention 
but they're also destroying our collective attention as a society. We can't talk to each other, we can't listen to each other, we tribalise, we become full of rage and hatred and contempt. If you are plugged into what the journalist Maggie Haberman called an anger-based video game, which is what these sites have become, that anger doesn't get left behind when you close the apps and go out into the world, right? We've got to go to the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is the current business model. And there's a solution to this. It was explained to me by lots of the people who designed key aspects of how the internet worked. So for example, Aza Raskin said to me, solution here is very obvious. You've got to ban this current business model, which Professor Shoshona Zuboff called surveillance capitalism. Just ban it, get rid of it. We don't need it. Just say that a business model based on tracking people in order to discover weaknesses in their attention and then selling their attention to the highest bidder, we do not allow that as a society. And I remember saying to Aza and lots of the other people who in Silicon Valley who told me this was the answer, what happens the day after the ban when I open Facebook and Twitter? Does it just say, sorry mate, we've gone fishing? And they said, of course not. What would happen is they would have to move to a different business model. One is very simple, it's subscription. You pay 50 cents or whatever it would be a month and you get access to Facebook, just like we do with Netflix and loads of other things. That's one model. Another model is something that everyone has experience of very close to them right now. Wherever you are, unless you're in a very obscure part of the world, you're very close to a sewage pipe. Now, before we had sewage pipes, we had shit in the streets, we had cholera. So together, we all pay for sewers to be built and we maintain the sewage pipes together and we own the sewers together. Now, it might be that in the same way that we own the sewage pipes together, we want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the kind of equivalent of cholera for our attention. If there's a subscription model or if there's some kind of public ownership independent of government, suddenly you're not the product anymore. You're the customer. At the moment, we have a model of social media that is designed explicitly, as Sean Parker, one of the key initial founders of Facebook, has admitted, to hack and invade attention. But it's just as technologically easy and it's just as politically feasible to have a social media that's designed instead to heal your attention. Now, Facebook will never do that of their own accord. We have to make them do it. And there's a really good historical analogy for this. Something very similar happened in the past and we put it right. Until the 1970s, it was quite common for people to paint their homes with lead paint and to put leaded petrol into their cars. Actually, it was known from the 1920s that exposure to lead really damages children's brains, their ability to focus, their ability to pay attention. But the entire lead industry funded a kind of fake branch of science to deny the evidence. But by the time you got to the 1970s, that science, it was just undeniable that lead was causing these profound negative effects. And so what happened? There was a movement of ordinary people led in Britain by a housewife called Jill Runette, who just said, we're not gonna let these people do this to our children's brains. No, we don't tolerate it. And they were not saying, well, let's ban paint, let's ban petrol. They were saying, let's ban the specific component in lead and petrol that is harming our kids' attention. So they were banned. And in most countries in the world, they're now banned. What I'm arguing for is that we've got to do something similar with social media. We've got to deal collectively with the specific component that is fucking your focus and mine. Your brain is healthier because Jill Runette and all those other people fought to protect your brain from exposure to lead. Now it's our job to protect the next generation from a business model for social media that is profoundly damaging our ability to focus and pay attention. Jill Runette didn't say, this is really hard. She didn't give up, she got up, and she fought and lots of other people joined her. I think we need an attention movement to reclaim our minds. We are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies. We own our own minds and we can take them back if we want to. Please join Double Down News on Patreon. This is a model of attention, exactly the kind of sane attention we need. These guys can make videos like this because they're not slaves to the algorithm. They're not dependent on advertising. They're dependent on you and me. So please support them. Go now and sign up to Patreon Double Down News.